Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, thank, Alex, yeah, thanks. Uh, a very, very warm welcome, uh, generally, to this year's edition, the seventh of the Georgetown Literary Festival. Uh, I think it's not being immodest to say it's Malaysia's leading literary festival, although there are apparently rivals in Kuala Lumpur, which I've heard about on the rumor mill. Um, it's a very special morning indeed, not only because it's the opening morning of, of the Literary Festival, but it's also the inaugural Translators Roundtable. And this is something that we are indeed uh, uh, proud of for a number of reasons. Translation obviously features in a great number of literary and writers' festivals around the world. Uh, Jaipur, for example, Ubud, uh, even Singapore Writers' Festival. But I think it's fair to say that this is possibly the, the first literary festival that has a dedicated ring-fenced space in order to engage with uh, this most important aspect of the world of letters. And the literary uh, festival last year uh, took a decision to uh, invite uh, Pauline Fan, standing on my left, and myself, Gareth Richards, to be the co-curators of the Translators' Roundtable. And today, therefore, is the fruits of our thoughts and our labors and our contacts and a lot of hard work and a little bit of inspiration on the way. So we're very, very happy that uh, you've come this morning to support the Translators' Roundtable. I'd like to just preface uh, the, the first uh, session that we're about to have with just a, a few words about why it's very apposite and opportune to have a translation roundtable here in Penang in particular. The first very obvious thing to say <clears throat> is that Malaysia in general and Penang in particular, of course, is a deeply and in a very complex way a polyglot society. Uh, that's been the case since uh, the settlement of Penang in the late 18th century. And it's reflective of uh, the culture, the society, and indeed the politics of Malaysia uh, in very many interesting, complex, and contested ways. Uh, as you all know, Malaysia has uh, uh, a number of official languages. And there's been uh, one of the key features, historical features, of literary production in the country over the last century has been the attempt to, as Rachel Leo puts it, tame Babel, tame the multiplicity and the polyglot nature of society. And that process is very interesting. It informs uh, the kind of cultural politics of language in this country. And for that reason, uh, as well as others, I think uh, the, the, the fact that we're having a translator's round table uh, is very apposite. Uh, a second interesting uh, sociolinguistic fact is that all the world's four great writing systems have a presence here in Penang. That may confuse some of you, so let me just explain a little bit. Broadly speaking, sociolinguists divide the world's languages into four major writing systems. So if we have an alphabetic system, of course represented by Rumi Malay, uh, we have the ideogram system, of course, represented in Chinese languages. Uh, we also have uh, abjad, derived from Semitic languages, which is the script in which Jawi Malay is presented. And not forgetting, of course, Abu Gida, which is the script used in Brahmic languages, including one of the world's great and oldest languages, Tamil. And all four of those languages are represented here both in everyday life and in official discourse. Just think for a moment of this building, this very fine building, but the street that we are sitting on, Ga Labu China. Three words already carrying three different language codes and three different cultural uh, communities. Ga, of course, from Indian subcontinent, Labu, Malay, China, the Malay word, but for China. So that's just an interesting little uh, uh, snippet. 
Another historical uh, reason uh, that I think makes the Translators Roundtable uh, appetite for the Literary Festival is the simple historical fact that Penang has been one of the great publishing and print hubs of the Nusantara of Southeast Asia since the first decade of the 19th century. The first printing press was set up here in 1806, and inevitably, the print revolution also fostered a translation a tradition in the region. And it's very important to, to underline the fact that this tradition was not in what you would expect always a translation into the metropolitan language, i.e. in this area, into English. The networks of translation were far more interesting and far more complex than that. Let me just give you a couple of examples. The importation of Chinese classical literature, some of the great literary uh, 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 texts from the classical canon, brought into the Nusantara, brought into Penang, Singapore, the Straits, via Peranakan translators, and their works rendered into Malay. So you have a very interesting uh, linkage there between classical Chinese literature and the Malay world. Or, and I always like this particular example, the fact that uh, French detective uh, fiction of the 19th century uh, brought into Penang Malay, uh, translated by Al Hadi and others, via uh, Arabic translation. So there's kind of a double movement there going on. And this was Penang. This was publishing and printing houses in the streets not more than a kilometer from here. So I think Penang has a very rich tradition. And I think part of what we're doing today is to honor that tradition and uh, um, to carry that tradition forward in new and exciting ways. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a marvelous roster of speakers for the Translators Roundtable. But the people involved in translation work are by no means confined to those who will be speaking today. Uh, and we have people who've worked as translators, as editors, as publishers, as, uh, as humble booksellers, as myself, uh, to promote and take forward um, literature in uh, translation. Their work uh, ranges from classical Chinese and Sanskrit. We have Asya Sata here, the, the great translator of the Ramayana, uh, to people working in very everyday, gritty, urban, 21st century, vernacular-driven texts. So a huge panoply, a huge range of uh, texts are represented by our speakers. So with those few words of introduction, a uh, very, very warm welcome to all of you. And I'm going to hand over now to my co-curator, who's going to lead us through the first substantive session of the Translators' Roundtable. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Pauline Fan. Thank you very much, Gareth. Um, I'm going to introduce um, and welcome both panelists to join me here. So want me to sit in the middle? Are you more comfortable? Do do okay, I'll sit in the middle. Sure. Uh, thank you, Gareth, for that wonderful introduction. It is really a privilege um, to be here with all of you and with such eminent um, panelists. Um, let me just briefly introduce both my panelists here. Um, John McGlynn is the co-founder of the now legendary Lontar Foundation in Indonesia. Um, which is at least 30 years, 30 years um, old, has really become one of the s seminal institutions of the region um, and completely dedicated to the translation of Indonesian literary works um, into English. In, only into English? Most, mostly into English, primarily into English. Um, and it's really been the, one of the foremost um, bodies out there which is really introducing int Indonesian literature to the world, um, both across the ages, both classical texts as well as uh, modernist and postmodern texts. Um, and we're also very, very pleased to have here uh, Li Yuliong, who is the founding editor 
of Asymtot, which is the premier site and um, of, uh, of literary translation in the world now. And for those of you who haven't visited Asymtot, please do. It's a journal um, that really gathers together some of the most eminent and most exciting um, names in literary translation. It's really done some incredible work in, I think, opening up um, the readership to foreign texts, opening up the readership of the English world to foreign texts. Um, it's doing some very interesting work, not only of showcasing translation, but also of showcasing and thinking about translation itself and why it matters, um, engaging eminent translators in discussions and so forth. Um, so just to, I do just want to start by saying that um, the title of this, of the panel, The Tongue Set Free, some of you may think that it rings a bell. For, some of you may have read it somewhere before and it is actually a title that is borrowed from the English translation of a German text. Um, the German text is uh, the memoir, the first volume of the memoir by Elias Canetti, and which in German actually is called Die Gerettete Zunge, which doesn't really translate into, it's, the literal translation is not um, the tongue set free. Um, the, in the German sense, it really means that the tongue is, has been rescued or saved. Um, Gerettete, so retten is to save. And Elias Canetti had started off his, this memoir um, with this episode, it was his earliest memory actually of him, kind of a, almost a, a horrible experience, kind of menacing experience that he had as a child where his neighbor um, had come to him and with a jackknife and threatened to cut off his tongue. And he did this kind of in jest, but also to threaten the boy not to tell on him. Um, he was the lover of the servant, so he, to keep the secret or else his tongue would be cut off. So this was um, the sense in which Canetti actually used this term. However, it has a kind of metaphorical meaning as well because Canetti, of course, grew up in many, many different countries and different environments and different languages. And in his growing up, actually struggled to find his own language. Um, he, he grew up in Bulgaria. He was from a, um, a Jewish family who had migrated there. Um, he then moved to Manchester. He grew up also in Vienna and in Zurich and elsewhere, but eventually settled on German as his mother, as the language he felt most comfortable in expressing himself. But in doing that, and it, this is very clear in his memoir, is that that in itself, um, he was sort of rescuing his own language from silence um, and also to, to find how best to, to use that language um, in a way that, or to encapsulate his own experience. Um, some of this, I think, is extremely relevant to the act of translation. Um, it's why I actually settled on this um, title for this panel, Die Gerettete Zung, in both ways. I think we do, um, sometimes the act of translation is an act of, um, if not saving, perhaps rescuing or garnering something that might be lost in translation. Um, also, an act of finding, finding something new. Um, so I do just want to engage now my, my two speakers. Um, in, of course, both... Um, translation, of course, is a translation not just of language and not just of meaning. Um, it's also a translation of a culture in itself. And a culture... Each culture, of course, carries with it... Um, Inher inherited meanings, as well as uh, things that are untranslatable. Um, I think in both your work, perhaps I'll start with John, because you're working with Indonesian, which is Bahasa Indonesia, which um, does carry a kind of a very strong cultural heritage. How do you work through that in in your translation? I mean. Do you, is it, how do you translate something that is so embedded in a culture? Gosh. Good morning, everybody. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pauline, for, being, for moderating this session. Thank you, Gareth, for inviting me. Thank you, Bernice, whoever, wherever she is. But um, 
I don't know. Um, where do I start? Uh, I fell into Indonesia. I came to Indonesia 40 years ago after studying Wayang Kulit, the Shadow Puppet Theater. I had no intention of ever becoming a translator. Um, but after becoming semi-fluent in Indonesian and constantly being asked to translate into English by artist friends that I had met, literary friends that I had met, it became, it became fun for me. It became a game for me. Um, there's, there's, there's always difficulty in translating anything from one, from target language to source language, but it is a game. And um, the tongue set free, well, I, I found, people talk about the restriction of translation. I found a freedom, I found a freedom, actually. The thing is, uh, with English, with all our tenses and our genders and that kind of thing. And then in Indonesian, without tense, without gender. And we have to make that equivalent in English. Um, it, it, it just became uh, a, a, game for, a, a game for me. Um, I don't know what else to say besides uh, the you try to recreate, you try to recreate, and you can't just translate, you do have to recreate. You have to embed knowledge. I mean, you have to, uh, let's take an example, Amir Hamza, the classic Malay Indonesian, Indonesian poet. If you don't know Sufism, if you don't know, you know Malay traditions, if you don't know, well, you can translate one level of that language into English, but you can't translate everything. You can't translate everything. You do have to, um, make your choices there, and, uh, that, which is why I've never translated Ahmed Hamza, because, <laughs> because I don't want to give up those other three levels that I could translate. And uh, Yuliao, I'd like to ask you a similar question, also about this idea of language either being something that is imprisoning or something that is liberating. I mean, it does, in some senses we are restricted by language and in the sense that we can't or we can, but it's difficult to think outside of language, and it's difficult to express oneself outside of language, but in doing that, are we imprisoned somehow in that language, and how do we actually work our way out of that prison? Um, I also want to thank uh, Bernice, Pauline, yourself, and uh, Gareth for inviting me to this. Uh, is all, are you listening? Okay. Uh, to this panel. Um, first of all, I actually felt quite stumped by this question, uh, at first, and I was thinking in terms of like maybe um, unlocking the the language so that more people, um, let's say, if you're writing in uh, in Malay or in Chinese, but maybe you want to reach a global audience of uh, English readers, so translation would be a means of liberating that language. But um, I was also talking to one uh, a literary agent yesterday, and she she spoke about liberation in terms of reach uh, you know the com commercial potential of you know when works are translated into english there's so much uh, more readers who will buy your books etc etc but i felt that this was all to do with the actual uh, outcome of you know the, the translation the translated product and i wanted to uh, talk about what how a, a, a writer himself can be liberated or can feel imprisoned by the the choice of language with which she uses to write, right? Um, and so um, I thought about it and I felt that maybe the best way to answer this question would be to look at some of the interviews with uh, some multilingual writers that we've published, uh, including Ha Jin uh, or Yuko Otomo. Both of them, uh, their native languages were Chinese and Japanese respectively, but they chose to write in English instead, right? Uh, and for Ha Jin, uh, she, he felt that writing in Chinese, uh, he kept feeling the shadow of censorship looming over him. So that's how, that's how he came to write in English, which is uh, not even his uh, most comfortable language that he, he's, you know, he feels you know, comfortable expressing himself with, right? Um, so, and he finds liberation in being alone. He's sort of like this trailblazing figure of uh, Chinese letters who has chosen instead to write in English. And that for him, the fact that he's figuring out his own way, that is uh, a liberation for him. Uh, on the other hand, you have Yuko Otomo, and uh, she 
she encapsulated it so well that I think that the best way to uh, convey what she, she actually said it would be to actually quote her. Uh, and this is what she said. Um, and she uses the term exophonic. Uh, exophonic means you're writing in a language that's not your native language, okay? So here, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read from this passage. Although disadvantages look more evident, exophonic writers have certain advantages. We are given a rare opportunity to mirror ourselves in a multi-language identity. As we experience similarities and differences between languages, we learn how to break, alter, or invent rules for our new reality. So you have this, this, this really cool uh, concept of, you know, you're actually switching skins. And in switching skins, you find a new identity, and that's very liberating for, for her as a writer. So I, I think that these two writers offer us some kind of answer to this question of imprisonment and liberation within the language. Um, related to that, I just want to maybe bring people back. Many of you probably know this essay very well, but Walter Benjamin um, wrote a very seminal essay called The Task of the Translator. Um, and in that, he does have actually a passage that speaks about the imprisonment and also the release or liberation of a certain element of language. Um, I'm just going to quote him that he, he said that it is the task of the translator to release in his own language that pure language that is under the spell of another, to liberate the language imprisoned in a work, in his recreation of that work. So in that act, it was something like what you were talking about earlier, John, that in actually doing, in the act of translation itself, um, you are finding in English a way to express the Indonesian. And in doing that, in, you are actually in a way recreating even, releasing something in the English language and liberating the English language from its own restrictions, as well as liberating the, the con Indonesian from just being confined to the Indonesian language. That's true. The thing is, um, languages, words, these are constructs. They, they, they are not meaning themselves. I mean, you know, M-A-R-K, Mark, you know, well, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so what you're doing is, in, in the translation process, is you're, you're trying to find the essence, the pur that purity within that word. The words don't matter so much. It's what's behind those words. And you try to find that essence and change it into the similar, if, if possible, similar or essence in, in your target language. But of course, we're talking about as if translation is just a one-way thing. The thing is we translate from, let's say, Indonesian or Malay into in English, well, then it's trapped in English too. I mean, the thing is there's <laughs> a hell of a lot more languages than English around the world. And um, how, do we set free, how do we set that free around the world? And that's, that's the big question. Certainly, that's one of the questions we deal with, I think, in Malaysia. Sometimes, I mean, we do feel there are, like Gareth said, there are, it's a polyglot society, multilingual society, but very often we don't even read each other. I mean, we have these kind of existing communities, the Malay literary scene, the English language literary scene, the Chinese and the Tamil, but very often they're not, we're not even translating across each other, and we are quite isolated, to be honest. Hopefully, this is one of the efforts that we're trying to actually... Um, speak a little bit more closely and really f discover one another a little more closely. Um, and Yu Longya, maybe you could also respond to John's um, John's question about how how do you actually liberate language? So translating into English, sure. but then English itself is the kind of okay um, confined. So for for example, um, some of you may know about this uh, superior Whorf hypothesis. Well, basically, it's, it's just a fancy name for a concept that states that um, one's experience of the world is inextricably bound to the language with which one uses to perceive the world. So, for example, uh, depending on the number of types and basic color words you have in your vocabulary, you would experience a rainbow completely differently from another person of a different language. Uh, so, this is sort of like a a really strange idea for some of us who are multilingual who don't really s feel that way when we suddenly speak in English and 
you know. Um, but we were talking in, uh, in Mandarin just a few minutes ago. So um, I feel that translators um, don't often subscribe to this worldview. They're more uh, optimistic, right? They're more optimistic. Uh, they trust in what you would call the linguistic hospitality of the target language. Okay, so um, to, to, to use that metaphor a little bit more, uh, uh, say, let's say your, the original is, is your home and it's where you live. And maybe translation as a process is like traveling overseas without a suitcase. And uh, maybe the outcome of translation could be staying in a hotel room like the Royal Shulan Penang, right? And so even though uh, you are used to Colgate, uh, the, the toothpaste in your home, you know, whisper mint uh, in, in the hotel room does the trick just as well. And then there are new horizons when you look out of the window, right? And just the, the, the people you see are different. Well, the number of uh, audiences and, and this, the kind of reception to your literary work changes when it's in a different language. Um, as to John's uh, wonderful question about how, what we can do to truly liberate, you know, a, a translation, uh, a, a piece of work, right? Uh, well, I can think of one way, which is to commission multiple translations into as many languages as you can think of. And um, we actually did this uh, at Asymptote. Um, actually, there's, there's a, a brochure I brought with, with me today. I actually have more of it uh, in my bag, and I'll be happy to, to give any of you uh, the brochure if you are interested in hearing more about my, my magazine. My asymptote is, is a really multi-continental endeavor. Um, we ha we're currently 100 strong, and so we're able to do a lot of things that a lot of other magazines can't even dream of. So for example, um, in 2014, there was this, uh, uh, I don't know if you, you read in the news, but 43 Me Mexican girls were abducted from a school. They were just, they were just disappeared, right? And there was this uh, Mexican poet, uh, David Urta, and he wrote this very stirring poem called Se Ayodinapa, which Ayodinapa is the name of the region where the school uh, is found. And um, within 20 days, within 10 days actually, of his writing the poem, our entire team uh, worked hard on 20 translations from uh, the Arabic to the Bosnian to Croatian. Uh, and we turned it around, we presented it along with an introduction by the media study, a very uh, rising uh, Mexican novelist. And in addition to that, we had audio recordings of each translation uh, presented with the texts themselves. And so I was quite heartened uh, when it was picked up, this, this audible global coming together was picked up by uh, Reforma, one of the largest Mexican newspapers. And the news of what we had done even reached the school itself in Ayotzinapa. So um, through this endeavor, one of um, the poorest regions in Mexico actually, uh, actually uh, was able to find that you know, they were not alone. There were, there were voices from all over the world pinging back uh, and uh, showing their support and their solidarity. And I think that this is... Um, uh, an example of a kind of multilingual translation project, what it can do uh, uh, to sort of like spread the world and really liberate uh, uh, something like literature. Yeah. Could I add something? We talk about uh, translating, oftentimes the translation is viewed as kind of a, uh, a, a child, an orphan, orphan child, but an orphan uh, and not, it's not the true language. The thing is, what we do when we translate, I mean, we also enrich those other languages. I mean, think of English. I mean, if, if we didn't have all the French words, if we didn't have the German words, if we didn't have the Italian words, if we didn't have amok or ketchup or, you know, all these words from Malay, you know, English would be a very different word, you know. And, and the same way in Indonesian, all these Arabic and Sanskrit-based words, you know, we're enriching. We're enriching. <laughs> even in literature itself, I think. I mean, I think like the, the translations, even however flawed, of Ezra Pound, of classical Chinese, even though there are flaws in them, I mean, I think really enriched the English language and the, that period of modernism as well. Um, similarly, in the German, I mean, the translations of someone like Paul Celan from the Russian, there's also his translations of Osip Mandelstam are really masterpieces in themselves, and I think really rank 
um, with some of the best German literature that has ever been written. I mean, it has the g translations themselves can really be works of art. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit, of John, about what what urged you and your co-founders really to set up the Lontar Foundation, and what was at the time thirty years ago. What was it that was happening in the world that really brought you to that decision that you need to have this kind of this institutional organization in Indonesia? Well, given that I'm speaking here in Malaysia, you probably also know that um, we get Malaysia, we get very little coverage. Very get, we get very little positive coverage outside of the region. And in Indonesia, when I first came there 40 years ago, the only things that made it into the media were, was corruption, blah, 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 blah. All these things that should be reported, yes, but there was no balance. And um, I had gotten to know enough Indonesian, read enough Indonesian that I was saying, my God, you know, why aren't you know, people seeing this side of Indonesia too? At least to create a balance. That, what, that was the initial thing. And then there's another reason is also, I wanted my family, my loved ones in the United States to know what I was doing in Indonesia. And, um, and the only way I could do that was through translating, translating. And then, and then the third is after this process of discovery. Um, gosh, you know, there is a canon of literature in Indonesian, but it's not reflected in English. And, uh, what were those first works that were translated? Um, it was, uh, first one was, my first one was a collection of uh, uh, women's poetry, actually. And then, and then, and then I, I'm one of the few translators who do a lot of poetry, do a lot of poetry. Because I think that in, in Indonesian, Malay at least, that literary genre is the strongest, I do feel that. And next, Chirpan, short stories, and after that, only the novel. But, um, but I, tr I like to, you know, I like to translate what I like. And I, you know, <laughs> and then, as I said earlier, it's a game. Oh, can I make that in English? I mean, I first studied Malay a long time ago, and a couple, a couple years ago, I translated Sha'ir Lampung Karam, a Sha'ir, you know, which I did in Sha'ir format in English, which was, you know, <laughs> a big challenge. <laughs> And uh, Yuleong, similarly, what was it that, what was, what was it, and when actually was Asimtet founded? Uh, 2011, but 11. I started working on it um, from July 2010 onwards. And was it you with a group of people who came together? Was it just your brainchild? Well, actually, it was pretty much me. I came up with everything, uh, even the money, the idea, the name. Um, and I was the one really pulling all the weight at the beginning. Most of them, uh, the, the other team members, were working as sort of like uh, editors, but they didn't really do anything for the copy. In terms of editing, um, I mean, there's a lot of things to do, right? There's up, uh, uploading the content, there's uh, proofreading. So they were all sort of detached from the process, but they helped to solicit work, mm -hmm. which was still very integral to uh, uh, Asymptote. What pushed you to, to found? Yeah, what, what pushed me to found? That's a really good question. I think it all goes back to um, 2002, 2003. I think uh, that year, um, um, my visual arts professor gave me uh, a book called The Gift by Lewis Hyde. And in the book, uh, he talks about John, uh, Hyde talks about John, uh, George Bernard Shaw's uh, quotation. Like, it, it's, this is really good. So. Uh, if you have an apple and I have an apple, you know, and if we exchange apples, um, we'll each get an apple back, right? But if you have an idea and, and if, if someone else has an idea and you talk to each other and at the end of, end of conversation, you get two ideas each, right? So similarly with intangible uh, works of art like um, literature, poems, short stories, you know, the the potential to reach millions is, is, is really there. And the, the way to unlock it is really through translation itself. And um, I was at that point, um, you know, feeling like, you know, there's, there are not so many avenues for uh, Asian writing, you know, uh, all, the, all the stuff that I love from Taiwan or Singapore uh, isn't making its way out to English audiences around the world. I felt that, I felt very much that, you know, um, 
you had all these white publishers who were based in New York and London offices who were deciding what the world reads, right? And look at where it's gotten us. Uh, in, in the last five years, you have three Nobel Prize winners who write in English. In the last 10 years, you have nine out of 10 who write in a European language. The only one being Mo Yen, uh, who writes in Chinese, right? So uh, this is very skewed, this is a really skewed um, uh, canon that we call world, world literature, uh, which is really ironic, uh, given that it's so Eurocentric. Um, and I think we can do better, you know, in this globalized age of, uh, of, uh, of literature. So uh, my, my thought behind Asymptote was to feature diversity, not only on our pages, but also in the masthead itself. So I have section editors and editors at large based in six continents all over the world. And uh, they often live where the writers we publish live. And so they're able to judge the importance of the writer's work as well as it, the fidelity of the translation itself. So it's not really a revolutionary thing, I think. A world literature journal made up by editors from around the world. But I think it was the first time that anyone had done it. Um, translation is always or very often also political. And how, of course, the Lontar Foundation, in some of the work that you've done, how do you respond directly or indirectly to the political climate, either of Indonesia or of the, or of the region? Have you done specific works in response to, to the political climate? Yeah, there's two, there's, there's two things. Uh, one thing, um, you, I mean, we want to translate works that, are po you know, works that are popular, works that are respected. At the same time, uh, this uh, secret uh, agenda of mine is also to inform the world about uh, what's going on in Indonesia. And um, so we do uh, sometimes make a conscious decision to uh, publish books that uh, might not be, you know, popular in Indonesia. Could you? Uh, I'll show some uh, some covers of th books about like 1965. Um, there's, you know, there's like Pramudia, the bi biography which I translated and, and published. Go on. Uh, and th this is an indirect one. This Sujina was in prison for 19 years for her involvement in a, a left-wing organization. There's, no there's nothing about communism here. There's nothing about 65. It's the stories about women in prison. Asrukia, she was also um, blacklisted as a result of 65. She was a secretary for the, a left-wing organization. She was tortured. She was raped. And by bringing her back into print, she was a, she was a forgotten author. So that's indirect. Go on. Here is Indonesian exiles. This is a, this is in Indonesian. Uh, hundreds, thousands of Indonesian ex writers were exiled abroad. Continued to pr produce literature. So so these two books were the first ever in Indonesian about this ex about this experience. Go on. And then, and then there's uh, Leila Hudori, who, as you know, home, a novel about 65, go on. And then another, one, another novel about 60, yeah. And then Putuoka Sukanta, a former political prisoner, um, his short stories, and Ahmad Tohari, the next one, about that. But also, then, the thing is politics. Uh, one thing about uh, Asia or Indonesia in general is, it, is People don't think of Indonesians as sexual, and uh, <laughs> so much less having you know, like, you know, oh, that's Michael Vacchiotto's book on '65 as well. Go on, and then and then reportage on '65 itself, but uh, and then, but I've made a conscious decision to do things on you know on LGBT issue, issues because there's so many uh, you know mis. False views. So you know, this is the first ever compilation of Indonesian short stories about you know, gay life in Indonesia, and uh, a novel uh, set in Indonesia. This is under our Amana imprint, and then lesbianism in Western Sumatra. The next one, <laughs> next one, and then uh, here, women, women's love in Bali. Go on. 
Yeah, and, and the first collection in English of uh, LGBT stories. Go on. Yeah, plays and so on and so forth. I mean, we try to do as many things as possible. And, and we, I mean, I, in addition to, and, the, and this last one, this was also published in Malaysia under the title Dosa, Sin, which, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but that, but. Yeah, um, and we're also doing things on religion. Mm -hmm. Religion. attitudes abroad about what Indonesians are. <laughs> what is the reception like? Very healthy, very healthy. I mean, I was the program coordinator for the Frankfurt Book Fair uh, uh, when Indonesia was guest of honor country, and we brought 70 authors, you know, and there's, you know, beautiful women in mini skirts, and there's, and there's you know, beautiful women in, you know, tudung, you know, I, I mean, but uh, just having the whole, cha you know, having the whole gamut, gamut of, uh, of speakers, it was refreshing. <laughs> and similarly, Yuleong, Asymptote has also taken stands sometimes, um, create very creatively, to some of the sort of political climate and, and situations in the world. Could you talk about some of that? Uh, yes, um, so I, I remember Donald Trump being mentioned in the um, the theme, right? We're talking about monsters, <laughs> and hopefully not immortal monsters. Um, so, uh, as all of you know, in uh, January 28th of this year, he issued a travel ban, which was like sudden. Which, like people were stopped at airports. They were, you know, turned back. They had to fly back. Some were even stranded in their layover flights. Um, so I felt really bad about this because I lived in America uh, myself, and uh, I couldn't believe what was what was going on. And I thought that I had after a sleepless night, one particularly bad sleepless night, I wrote an email to my team members and said, "We are gonna, we have to do something." So uh, we already had plans for our April issue. Uh, it was going to feature our contest winners, but we decided to push that back to July. And instead, I, I mobilized my team, uh, not only to uh, help to solicit work for a showcase of uh, writers from the seven countries that were being banned by Donald Trump, but we also put together a fundraiser because we wanted to pay all the contributors. We wanted to have enough money to um, sort of like put out paid ads and uh, get more readers to this showcase. Because I feel that the only thing that we can do, as, as for, for writers at least, or for editors, when a group is othered, right, you, you can try to remedy that by providing a very visible platform uh, uh, to share their stories, to speak up, and to tell what it's actually like uh, living in those seven banned countries, so that they're not monsters to uh, uh, people in the U.S., right? I mean, Donald Trump tries to paint them all as criminals and drug dealers, etc. But, you know, these are people, ordinary people like you and me, and I wanted to express that through literature. Um, I think that in the end, we did quite well. Uh, we invited uh, Mahmoud Daulatabadi. Uh, he's, uh, he's the author of The Colonel, and uh, in fact, he's pretty much the most prominent living Iranian author, novelist in, at the moment. And he offered a, a piece of nonfiction about his view uh, toward the travel ban that was really quite enlightening. Uh, we had a lot of poets uh, like uh, uh, Nega Amrani from uh, uh, Iran also, uh, from Somalia, we had some fiction. So it was, it was a really concerted effort and it was, it was really staggering to see how much support came pouring in for this uh, showcase. And in, in the end, we raised something about 14,000 US dollars. And uh, I think we were, the, we were the first journal to ever come up with a showcase like this uh, after the travel ban. It was released within three months on uh, April 17th. And so like uh, three months, less than two weeks, uh, we already responded with a travel ban that in George uh, Surtis words were an answer to, of um, eloquence to um, the, the harsh words of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so I, I felt that you know, that was really heartening, mm -hmm. that we were able to mobilize our team and uh, our readers as well to get this done. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, similarly, and I, I, I appreciate that, uh, 100 days after 9-11 happened, we published a collection of short stories and poetry by Indonesian authors who had lived in the United States and wrote about their experience in New York and that kind of thing, to, again, to show these people are not enemies, these, uh, you know, <laughs> which was well, very well received. We didn't make $14,000. Uh, $14,000, we didn't make it either. We just poured all the money back towards the writers and also to the actual showcase. Yeah. So before I open up uh, questions to the floor, yeah, actually, on t in terms of fundraising, how actually do you finance the Lonto Foundation? I mean, it can't be through book sales. No, it's definitely not through book sales. People like Gareth over there take so much, you know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, the, the, the simple mathematics of the publishing industry doesn't work today, you know, where you have to give 60% to distributors, 30% is uh, cost of production, 10% royalties, then 30% cost of translation. So, um, <laughs> so we're in the hole already. But... Um, uh, Lone Tower survived by begging, basically, be by begging. We, ma we do make about 30% of our uh, income on sales, about 30% on contributions from philanthropists, and 30% what we call kind of projects, you know, uh, like I'll do a big coffee table book on which I'll make a hefty sum of money. But um, otherwise, it's, it's, it's not sustainable. <laughs> Asymptote sustainable? Yes. <laughs> um, I think we are definitely not sustainable. In, I mean, at least you're making like 30%. You can break it down. For me, I've just absorbed all the costs other than sinking $50,000 of my own money into this platform that I truly believe in. Um, the, the way I've done it is to you know, keep the, the labor costs to almost zero. Like, <laughs> we, we are really driven by volunteers from all over the world. Uh, who volunteer anytime from anything from four to twelve hours a week, but I'm the one who puts in about fifty hours. Um, and when you know work is not done well or it just falls through at the last minute, everything accrues to me. Yeah, and, so, there, and there's translators. Without if if translators were not paid so shittily, yes. you know, we we couldn't survive either. Yeah, I mean, we we face a lot of challenges. We we have we go to, we have a lot of challenges because we are not a nationalistic foundation. I imagine that you might get some funding from Indonesian government, or not really, but maybe uh, people who believe in Indonesian literature, right? Who, who are wealthy Indonesian businessmen, patrons. Yeah, but almost everybody wants something, the tit for yeah. tat kind yeah. of thing. They want their logo, or they want their face, or they want yeah. their something. Yeah, you know? added, added to that, I think, is the problem of the fact that pri uh, literature is a private experience, right? It's not like a, a festival where, you know, you can, people show up, there are all these like, logos that, you know, you can display, and, you know, I'm a proud supporter of the Georgetown Literary Festival, but when it's reading, I mean, all the, the, the most important process of reading, you know, it's late at night when you're curled up with an iPad, you know, just before going to sleep, right? So who would want to sponsor that? Because nobody's going to really like, you know. Or, yeah, or you want to do iPad. a book on LGBT issues and, um, yeah. excuse me, the sponsor's kind of... Oh. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to say something. Um, we've definitely looked at all, all the different... Um, ways to sustain ourselves and I'm glad that we found one viable way and uh, those of you who are American and in the UK especially we are going to launch what is called an asymptote book club so um, you know those subscription services that uh, some people might have in the States for example you just pay a fixed sum like uh, 20, 20 bucks and every month, uh, maybe this makeup company sends you a, a, a box of goodies. Uh, it's, it's all a surprise. You open the box, you don't know what you'll find, right? Um, we're, we're thinking of doing the same thing for world literature, right? There's, there's, uh, there's, and we're partnering with a lot of uh, pub independent publishers uh, to uh, pick a surprise world liter literature title uh, that will be sent to you uh, every month for well, 12, 12 months. So over a year, maybe you pay 180 bucks, you get 12 books, and they're all specially selected by Asymptote editors. Yeah. It's a great idea, great idea. We're also registered as a non-profit organization in the United States, so uh, companies in the United States can give us money yeah. for, for 
tax I benefit. They do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to open up questions to the audience. Please engage our eminent and wonderful speakers. Don't be shy. Uh, if you could briefly introduce yourself before you ask the question as well. Yeah, I, I, mean, I would just like to comment that I mean, in, like Indonesia has one official national language, you know, Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesian. You know, other langu uh, uh, India has like 20 or 27 official languages. So in Indonesia, if you write in anything other than Indonesian, it's not Indonesian literature, even though it's written by an Indonesian author. And I some kind of support it, but at the same time, there's these people, I mean, just as Kelly was pointing out, who they really, I mean, what you're reading, it might be English, but it's really Indonesian. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the language is, and language is not bound necessarily by, by geography. Speaking of freeing the tongue, <clears throat> I should point out the fact that we are also a journal that has been a home for a lot of multilingual writing. So, so if maybe your Burmese poet also writes with Burmese and in English in the same work, um, that sort of thing would be welcomed at Asento. We actually have, we've actually done two special features on multilingual writing. Um, I, I think that we are we're now really past the age of like national borders, like, you know, one national language, etc. We really like to encourage the sort of ex experimentation. And um, there's probably a lot of multilingualism in the Malaysian community as well. So those of you in the, you know, who are writers, um, consider the fact that, you know, you can choose the language in which you write and try mixing it up too. I mean, if it frees yourself. Any more questions? Gunjus? About writers translating their own work. Well, if they're fluent in the target language, fine. I mean, uh, unfortunately, that is not the case of a lot of Indonesian authors who've tried to do that themselves and have produced awful translations in English. You know, um, but <laughs> you just can't get away from fluency. I mean, I love working with authors who are really well versed in English and then they can, you know, check, check my translations. But in the end, I have the final. I have the final say as the translator. It's my responsibility, you know. Um, but uh, Leila Hudo, I mean, a lot of Indonesian authors. They're very fluent in English, but they're. But they couldn't write, a novel in English. I mean, they couldn't translate their novel in English. Very few. I, I just saw a movie that was directed by, the same person, and it was his own biopic, 
And I think that's a bad idea in general. <laughs> because you, you don't have the distance to really grasp the, the, the true artistic value of the text uh, or, the, or the work or your, or your life even. What, what's, what's true about that uh, biopic, right? Um, I wouldn't say outright that uh, self-translations are bad. I mean, sometimes you really do have a, a wonderful bilingual uh, who is able to write equally effectively in both languages. But that's been far and few in between, I would say. Yeah, and um, the thing is, the translation being the recreation process, I think is poetry, novel, I do not put footnotes. I mean, I do not put footnotes. I mean... <laughs> in my things. You know, I try to embed the information that is necessary somewhere within the text so you get the meaning. But the the first, the, the novelist, if she or he translates, they tend to not know those things that are missing. Uh, there's another question. You're, you're exactly right, and I, what I really hate is literary critics who say, this was a bad translation. If they don't know that language, they cannot say, they cannot say that. You know, it, a good translation of a bad work, a bad, it reads bad in English. I mean, if, it's a, if it's a bosom buster in Malay, it has to be a bosom buster in English, you know. <laughs> You don't make it into Shakespeare, you know, <laughs> you know. But um, but yes. But but the thing is, we we as the reader can only judge the felicit. Uh, can, we can't judge the felicity of the translation, but we can judge the fluency of the English, you know. <laughs> and that's all we can do. But sometimes it don't, for older works, perhaps some of the works of sort of classic modernism. Um, you do when you have multiple translations, then you can actually start to see perhaps which translation reads better and there have been I mean for that very reason sometimes there have been multiple translations because one translator has found that a previous translation didn't quite work or perhaps even had errors and is then revised uh, I could play um, if I could just play Ad devil's advocate yeah. um, I was reading an interview uh, that we had done with brother Anthony of Taizé who is uh, uh, the p most prominent Korean translator at the moment and he actually said that um, in judging Korean to English translations, the perfect judge would actually be someone who didn't know Korean at all. Because he's basically going to pick, he's going to select this work and he's going to judge it based on whether it stands up against all the other English texts out there in the world. So if you're a reader of world literature, it, the, the, maybe obviously it has to be faithful right, uh, to a certain extent, but whether it works uh, in English you know, whether it's a live sparrow as opposed to a stuffed eagle, that, that's the question that, uh, uh, that's on the minds of judges in judging a work of translation. Yeah, and um, I don't know about you in the editing process, but I always give the translations to a person who does not know Indonesian. Yeah. You know, at the very end, I give them to somebody who doesn't know Indonesian. <laughs> exactly. What's this thing about American here? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly will have the inside scoop on how the vegetarian <laughs> came to me. In fact, she just told me yesterday there were two translations. Could you elaborate? Yeah, I mean, that, this, this, this book was translated 12 years ago by a, a very young, uh, up and translator who was very uh, uh, highly praised for her translation of the original script. Um, down at home, who was a the translator of my old time in Jew, and she did a wonderful reading as well. But what happened with the second translation, which is another now animated translator, Deborah Smith, who worked on the she came at it, she looked at the first translation of Dance, and she 
شام سمع بيها <laughs> making literature. Making literature. Making. Yeah. Mac, I see. Like instant. Yeah. Make it accessible and. Yeah. There's well, there's different ways of making books. I mean, the thing is, uh, you know, whether it's good literature. I mean, it, it, you look at the you look, look at the end product. I mean, I. Uh, how 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 the author got there? That's a different that's a different thing. But if it's with the author's approval, I think it's a different case from like the translator taking it on his, his or her own to do something with the original text. If the author does it, it's a, I give you know, full credit. But the translator, that's not our job. Um, I think also it's the, the question of the demographic you're targeting. So for example, if you're translating a play, right? Um, is it a play where you want to, uh, is it the kind of publication where you want to preserve every cultural detail in the original language, and maybe you have a lot of footnotes because this is meant for uh, scholars. You know, like you know, some of you have gone through O levels and you've read Shakespeare texts with endless footnotes. So, is that the kind of uh, translation do you want you want to make, or is is this a play where you know they're actually actually going to be actors who are going to be speaking the words? In that case, you may want to remember to punctuate so that the actors can breathe. Right, so I think it's it's all a question of the target audience, and uh, in 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 response to um, you know not translating everything, I remember a book uh, that was out in the early two thousands called the, uh, "Breaking the Tongue" by Vivian Lowe. Um, it's actually written by a Singaporean writer, and but published by uh, I think in published in the U.S. It's basically all English, and then near near the end. Uh, towards the climax of the novel, you have passages in Chinese, and she refused to footnote them. And in fact, it was even a hostile act to the, the English reader. Uh, and I, I remember her saying in an interview, because an interviewer actually asked her, would you care to explain what the Chinese words in this, in this book meant? She's like, no, I don't, want, I don't want to explain. So I think that is a, a sort of resistance uh, to, uh, to maybe the hegemony of the English language that uh, maybe she was doing some sort of uh, performance art through that book it itself. But there's only so much uh, you can test the audience. Uh, people who are in, in uh, book selling, literary agents, they will know that you, know, you can only do so much experimentation before uh, the reader decides, no, this book is not for me, right? So uh, insofar as you're concerned about how well your books move off the shelves, um, you might want to consider a more you know, a friendlier version for the translation. Just one last question, but if we could have our panelists to respond quickly.
I, compl I completely agree, but the, the, the fact that, I mean, the, the market drives everything, as we know, in this world. And there's no shortage of books being, uh, of being translated from English into Malay or Indonesian. There's no shortage going this way. It's the other way. It's this, we talk about glo you know, the global era. Well, it's not really global. It's, it's a one-way traffic, you know, from, from the West to the East in this, in this particular case. And without uh, government support, funding, that kind of thing, you know, we're not going the other way. Um, obviously, there's, there's a hegemony, as uh, John pointed out. Um, I feel there's also the fact that there is, is there's a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, we don't have a lot of works from Chinese, for example, being translated by mainstream publishers. So the publishers are always going to say, oh, but you know, nobody's going to buy a book written by a Chinese writer, right? So, um, but how do they know? Because they haven't taken the risk and they haven't actually done so, right? So I think what I've tried to do with Asymptote is to actually uh, push the envelope a little bit. Uh, each issue has worked from upwards of 30 countries, for example, and it's all free, and it's, it's where uh, publishers can find that, oh, there's actually a readership for such works. Um, Kelly, you wanted to say something? Okay, all right. Okay. We've unfortunately run out of time um, because the next session is starting very soon, and I think it's the two workshops, a workshop of translation um, from Malay to English, English to Malay, and also Chinese, Mandarin, uh, Chinese to English. So please join us for the two workshops. I think that will be here and also downstairs. Uh, just a quick word, uh, uh, these yes, brochures, because I'm all about spreading literature, uh, connecting authors to more readers, and it's free. So if you want to find out more information, it's, it's all here, and I'm going to give it out here. I believe, Come and say hi. I believe there are some of uh, John's, the Lanta Foundation's books available in the bookshop downstairs. Yes. Thank you very much.